as, as you drive around town, you, you start to see, well, not all of our communities look the same, do they? Some look pretty well off. Some not so much. Some look pretty new. <laughs> some not so much. Can you put that PowerPoint up there, Jim? But isn't it interesting that we, everywhere you go, everywhere you look, there's these fences. People build fences for all kinds of different reasons. That's a video. I don't want to play the video. My name's Donna, and I am originally from a small town. Maybe Jim has other plans. Just, is the cruise wearing off on you? Or what? <laughs> Should be, there you go. Down there at the very bottom. That's not, that's not his fault. We're doing something a little different this morning. So, <clears throat> But there's fences everywhere you look. And you're going to see some different fences as, I, as this scrolls through. Some fences are kind of crazy looking. People build fences out of some really strange things. Some fences don't look real sturdy can't surf build a fence out of your or if you can't ski build a fence out of your skis you all have all been to civil war parks where you see those and yeah keep the dogs in the backyard some fences look really nice and expensive some people build fences just for the sake of building fences and if you can't bowl build a fence out of the bowling ball i remember growing up our neighbors had a <clears throat> had a swimming pool in their backyard. And it was, a, it was a special thing to be able to go in their backyard and be able to go swim in their swimming pool. You had to be invited to go to the backyard and get in the pool. Now, everybody has, or, or most people have a front yard that uh, looks really nice. You, you spend time on the front yard because that's what people see. You spend money to make all the, the flowers look right and the, the shrubs look right and you keep the front of the house nice and clean and, 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 and you put up this facade that this is who we are. And then there's the backyard. That's where the dogs are at. That's where all the toys are at. That's where all of the fun stuff happens. That's where life happens is in the backyard. And we don't know if we realize we do this, but we start to build these fences and we start to separate ourselves and we start to, to do really weird things like uh, put up this front of saying, you're not welcome in my space. So I, I got to keep you all off the stage. I'm, I'm going to build a fence and uh, I, I'm going to stay up here in, in my little space where it's safe. And, and I'm not going to let you see the the real behind the scenes that happens up here because, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that takes place up here. And, and, and sometimes it's not pretty. Sometimes it gets ugly when we're rehearsing. And sometimes it's, it's uh, a little nerve-wracking standing back here and, and you see all the clutter and, and you wonder, what's all this stuff for? So I'm just going to keep you out here, out from here, and keep you out there where it's nice and comfortable. Is that, is that fair enough? Kind of like the backyard. I'll move them for Sunday. It's kind of like the backyard. You just keep looking at the front of the house. It's nice and pretty. We're going to live in the backyard. I remember our neighbors, their front yard was the yard of the month. It was, it was a gorgeous yard. And then the backyard had, had two backyards. One of them had a chain link fence. That's where we all got to go if you were really in the in crowd, go in the backyard and play, uh, play baseball or play football or, or whatever we wanted to play. We went in the very, very backyard. But then there was the wooden fence. You didn't go inside the wooden fence unless you were invited. That's where the barbecue grill was. Yeah. And man, he could cook. That's where the swimming pool was. Man, we had fun in that swimming pool. But you had to be special to get to the backyard. You know, we do the same thing. We put up these fences. And we tell people, you just look at the front yard. I don't want you to know who I really am. That's not community, if you think about it. That's a dangerous way to live, really. You know, we have... My fences disappeared. We have all these fences. Some fences are built just for the sake of keeping people in. 
Some fences are built because of offenses. That's a good point. Some fences are built specifically to keep people out. Some fences were destined to fall. That's where I want to go today. What are our fences? Why do we build these fences? Why do we put up these facades? Why do we put up these walls to keep people from getting to who the real us is? It it happens at the church, too. Not just on our personal lives, but it happens in the church, too. And and as as we continue on with this series, this concept is going to play a big part today of of, uh, what we'll see. How do we live connected lives with each other if we put these fences up? How can we live a connected life with God if this fence of sin is still in the way? What a perfect song to segue into that message. We're all just a sinner that's been saved by grace. Turn with me over to Hebrews chapter 10. I got the right references this time. It's verse 19 through 25. And I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. Yours may look just a little bit different, but it'll be on the screen for you. Starting in verse 19, And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter into heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened, new, opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Jim, can you put that PowerPoint back up? Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep His promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of His return is drawing near. I'm learning that there's another fence in my life. I'm trying contacts this week. Some of you have said, you don't look right without glasses. Apparently, I can't read right without them either because that's really little. So is that. But we'll get through it. The writer of Hebrews is talking about those fences. He's talking about fences that keep us from a relationship with Christ, but he's also talking to us about fences that keep us from a relationship with other. And, and if you remember last week, we talked about how can we ever love our church if we can't get connected? How can we ever love our church if we don't love one another? Let's go back to the image of the fences. Imagine the fences in your life. If a lot of us were honest with ourselves this morning, we would admit that our lives are, are kind of like a good fence. We're comfortable with showing people some of us, but we're not comfortable with showing people everything. We're comfortable with letting people see the made-up part of us that that comes out in public and goes to church on Sunday morning and goes to work during the week. But we're not comfortable with the ugly side of us that still struggles with things. We're not comfortable with the side of us that still has, oh, maybe some old habits that we're trying to break. We're not comfortable with the dirty laundry, so to speak. (laughs) Would you agree with that? We put up this decorative fence so that it all looks good. But the backyard's a whole different story. The backyard's where the clothes hangers or where the clothes lines are at and the laundry's hanging. The backyard's where the dogs run and well you step in their reminders that they're present. The backyard might have a hole in the fence. The backyard probably isn't weeded. The shed might need to be painted. But boy, the front yard sure looks good, don't it? We build these fences. We do this, and we, we don't even mean to sometime. But here's the deal with fences. God's not a real big fan of them. Now, I'm not telling you don't build a fence in your yard to separate your yard. He's, God's not telling you to tear down that fence. I'm not saying that at all. But God's not a fan of the fences that we put up in life. He's not a fan of the fences that we put up between each other. He's not a fan that we put up... The fences that we put up between the church and the community. In fact, he created ways to tear them down. And and if we intend to love our church the way that God intended for us to love the church, then we have to understand a few things. First is this. Is know this morning that Jesus crashed the fence. Before we even talk about the, 
the fence that we put between us and people, we have to realize that the barrier that exists between God and us. You know, this relationship, it's hard to happen if this relationship doesn't happen. So we need to understand that barrier that, that he puts between us. Look at the first few verses of, 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 of the, that we read here. Start in verse 19 again. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus has opened up a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go fully trusting him. Right into the presence of God with sincere hearts. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. If you remember, what was the most holy of place? It was the inner part of the temple that only one person was allowed to go into, and that was the priest. You and I, the, 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 the normal people, weren't allowed to go into that place. That's the place where the priest took all of their sins, took all of their wrongs, and at certain times would go into the Holy of Holies and would, would, would bless their sins and would, would, would petition for those to be clean. But there was only the one person that could go in. There was a fence that was put up for everybody else. You weren't welcome. You needed to be in there, but you weren't welcome in there. But what happened on the cross? What happened today that Jesus breathed his last? You remember the account of the curtain being torn. The curtain to the temple no longer exists. You know what that means for you and me? There's not one that needs to go on our behalf anymore. Because Jesus has done it. And we can go straight to Him. There's no fence between us and God anymore. There's only Jesus. How cool would it be if we took down all of our fences and we could go to one another with our burdens? We could go to one another with our problems. We could go to one another with our hurts. We could go to one another with our struggles. We could go to one another when something good happens. And we can cherish those moments with each other. I wonder how many people ever stood outside the temple wanting to get a peek in. But they couldn't because the fence was in the way. And they would tell themselves, if I could just get in there and just see it. Man, everything would be okay. But that fence was in the way. The curtain was in the way. The Hebrew writer is telling us we no longer live that way because of Christ's death. That fence is removed. So the relationship between you and God can take place. The relationship that he wanted from the very beginning can be restored. That fence can be removed. I'm going to tell you, if we can't get that fence out of the way, good luck removing these fences. Because it's hard to do. Paul tells us in Romans, he, he, he builds the story, he paints this picture of it, of it for us, the, the, the reality that we're born naturally with these fences. Uh, in, in, in Romans chapter uh, uh, 3, he tells us that all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. That's not a verse that's unfamiliar to you. You've heard that probably all your life. But let me give you my paraphrased version of it. It says this, we all have a giant fence. We were born with it. That fence is called sin. In Romans 6.23, he says that the wages of sin is what? It's death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. You could preach on that all day. Here's the paraphrased version of it. Because of that fence, we'll never get to God. Think about that. We never get that fence out of the way. We never allow Jesus to tear that fence down. We'll never have that relationship with God. In Romans 5, 8, he says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. We didn't ask for it. We don't deserve it. But he did it before we even knew that we were sinners. Here's the paraphrased version. God knew we'd have a big fence before we even had a yard. Think about that. Before we ever even had the yard to put the fence in, we were building the fence with that separation. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. You want to know how to know you're saved? There it is. If you believe it in your heart and you confess it with your mouth, 
It's hard to confess it if you don't believe it. Here's the paraphrased version. If we just admit we have a fence and we need it torn down, Jesus will crash the fence for us. It's one thing to know. It's another thing altogether to admit. A lot of stuff happens in the backyard that we don't want to talk about. A lot of stuff happens in the backyard that we're ashamed of. You know what? We can hide that from each other. We can put up bigger and bigger fences to hide that from each other. But if God knew we were ever going to build the fence before we ever even have the yard, do you not think he also knows what's on the other side of the fence? Absolutely. But if we just admit it, admit the fence is in the way, and that we need it torn down, Jesus is fully capable and fully willing and ready to tear that fence down for us. And then in Romans 10, 3, For they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. Boy, that could almost apply to our society today, couldn't it? They don't know God's way. They want to do it their way. Here's the paraphrased version. Maybe. He never denies a fence-crashing job, ever, to anyone. If they're willing to seek, and they're willing to admit, and they're willing to believe, and they're willing to accept. God's in the fence-crashing business. We're in the fence-building business. He's in the fence-crashing business. We're born with those fences. We're, we're, we're born with that sin. But we don't have to stay that way. If you think about it, we're born stuck in the backyard. But we don't have to stay in the backyard. God will get the fence out of the way and we can move to the front yard. You ever been drawn near to God? Have you ever just sensed His presence and felt that He was uh, just doing something amazing for you? Those fences come down. Imagine yourself standing on the, uh, on the edge of, of the cross. Uh, imagine yourself standing there at, at the hill on Golgotha the day that, that He was crucified. We sang that song a while ago, It's Finished. All the battles of all eternity were won right there. All of the fences that ever would be were torn down right there. If we accept it and we allow Him to do that. Do you remember the relief that you felt? Do you remember the excitement you felt? Do you remember the day that you accepted Him? Do you remember the overwhelming joy of being so near to Him that came into your life that day? There's not a greater feeling than that. There's just not. Because suddenly there is no separation between you and God. The fences are torn down. Everything is visible. Oh, that's scary. <laughs> But we do a very weird thing. God eliminated the fence of sin in our life by giving His Son. But we start picking up the broken pieces of that fence. And we may not put them between God and ourselves, but we start putting them between each other. We start trying to build that fence so that you don't see this fault that I have. So that you don't see the struggles that I deal with. And we start to pick up those pieces and we start to build that fence back. Well, that's not who God wants us to be. He's in the fence crashing business, not just of our sins, but in our relationships with each other. And I want you to understand something else. That realize that that barrier between you and Jesus has been crushed by Him on the cross. And by surrendering your life to Him, you draw into that and, and you step beyond that barrier and drawing near to Him in our relationship, we, we, close, uh, we become close to Him in community and it does something else. It, it gives us the ability to allow others into our yard. How many of you would be a little nervous to invite somebody into your backyard right now? I'll admit it. There's a dog back there. There's dog leftovers back there. How many of you would be comfortable right now inviting someone into your home? May not be the cleanest thing in the world. Might be laundry on the couch that hadn't been folded yet. Might be dishes that haven't been cleaned yet, but 
What do we have to hide? What does it say when we invite somebody in to see the real us? <laughs> we can allow others into our yard. We come into this place. We come into this building. We sing songs and we, we play games with the kids. And, and sometimes we, we eat and we smile and we say good morning and we enjoy a donut and we enjoy a cup of coffee. But we do it all from behind our fences. If, if you think about it, we still have our guard up. You might be thinking, but I thought you said Jesus broke down the fence, and he did. He did for every single one of us. Jesus has broke down that fence. But we still harbor these things. We still harbor these, these thoughts of, I don't want you to know who I am. What do we do about it? What do we do about that? If that's not what God wanted the church to look like, if that's not what he wants our relationships to look like, what do we do about it? Well, the writer tells us here in Hebrews. Look at verse, uh, um, I got it written down somewhere. Verse 26, he tells us, don't forsake the gathering of, of each other. Sorry, verse 25, he says, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. How often do you call each other? How often do you send a card? How often do you shoot a text or an email just encouraging one another? Don't forsake the gathering together. Now, does that mean sitting here in a comfortable pew or an uncomfortable pew, depending on which one you're sitting in, or sitting in a comfortable chair or in a theater seat and, and doing the church stuff? Is that the gathering together of the assembly? Well, in some ways, yes. But what about the rest of the week? We've got this gorgeous room that's used about three hours a week. Think about it. What do we do with the other hours of the week? Do we still gather together? Do we still hold each other in prayer? Do we still hold each other in our thoughts? And, and, and are, are, we, are we there when someone needs us? We can only be that way if we're willing to allow others into our yard. We can only be that way if we're allowing others to step over the barriers of those fences. You remember the show Home Improvement? Oh. The Taylors live next to Wilson for almost the entire show. And what do we know of Wilson? About that much. Howdy ho, neighbor. How many times did you see Tim standing at the fence talking to Wilson? But that's all you saw was from here up. Could you imagine if I stood up here and I preached from here up? What you going to get out of this? But do you know what we do every day? And we don't even realize we do it. We hide behind our fence just like Wilson. Oh, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to share with you a little bit. But only to the point that I'm not comfortable anymore. Wilson was a pretty good neighbor. By all respects. He had great advice. Oh, there. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, Tim would agree. Who did Tim always go to when he had a question? Al sure couldn't answer anything. He went to Wilson. I'd sure like to know what else Wilson was hiding behind that fence. I'd like to know what kind of person Wilson really was. I'd kind of like to know what kind of person some of you are. You may like to know what kind of a person I really am. Whose yard are you actually in? Who are you actually letting in your yard? Maybe it takes place through a Bible study. Maybe it takes place through a, a cup of coffee on a Sunday morning or a Sunday afternoon. Or, or maybe you get together with some that we don't even know about. And, and, and that's how you connect. That's how your, your interaction takes place. Maybe you've actually let the barriers down. And there's some that know you and know you well. I know some of you more than I, better than I know some of the others of you. Some of you know me really well. Some of you know I'm the pastor. Whose yard are you in? Who are you letting into your yard? That's the whole point of community, is to open up and to truly experience life with together. 
to truly experience life in a community together, loving each other, supporting each other, lifting each other, encouraging each other, being there for one another. When was the last time you got a phone call at midnight? I need help. (laughs) If you're not allowing somebody into your yard, they may not know that they can call you. They may not know that that phone call is available when they run off the road because the ice was worse than they thought it was. You know, as a pastor, sometimes you get some phone calls that you don't really want to get. You can tell the difference when it's a phone call to the pastor, and you can tell the difference when it's a phone call to someone they know they can trust. That hurts. Because as a pastor, you like to think, man, I know everybody. Everybody knows me. They know all of my secrets. They know who I am. They know they can trust me. But the reality is, I put up fences too. Just like all of us do. I love it when I get one of those phone calls that I know it's beyond the pastor. It's to someone that they know they can trust. I look across here at some of you. I had a problem. I know I could call you and you'd be there like that. Because I know I can trust you. It's because I'm in your yard a little bit, or you've been in my yard a little bit. That's what community is about. That's what being connected is about. Not standing at the fence and just talking a little, but really getting to know each other, really enjoying each other. Community standing in someone's yard. It, It is. It means you stand in someone else's yard, and not only do you stand there, but you also enjoy each other's company. Well, there's a shocking concept. How many times have you got into a conversation that you thought, this is going to be a great conversation, and about three sentences into it, you realize we have absolutely nothing in common. Boy, would you look at the time. i got to go. Those happen. But do you know what happens the next time you have the conversation? Instead of it being three sentences long, it's maybe four or five sentences long. And before you know it, you enjoy the conversation, and you quit trying to look for excuses to get out of it. That's enjoying one another. Imagine being a kid, and and you're invited to a birthday party. You don't really know this person. They just happen to be somebody in your class, and their their mom said, well, you're going to invite everybody in your class. And so you get to go to this birthday party, and you get there, and you really don't know anybody. Yeah, you know some names because you go to school with them. But this party's not really very organized. There's no... Pin the tail on the donkey. There's no uh, games to play. There's no real interacting. There's just a, a, a stale tray of chips on the table that I guess we're supposed to eat, and we're just sitting here. Boy, how out of place is that? Not really going to enjoy that company, are you? We've all been there. We've all done that. But community is not doing that. Community is opening and inviting and welcoming each other and enjoying each other. Verse 24 says, let us consider how to stimulate one another. In the the NLT, it says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and to good works. You ever thought about that? Community is finding ways to encourage one another to love and encouraging one another to do good deeds beyond just church programming. Beyond because it's said on an announcement slide that this is what we're doing. Beyond, well, it's spring, so I guess we're going to have a cleanup day. Enjoying the company and getting connected and finding ways to encourage us is doing things for each other and, and doing things with one another when it's not provoked, but when it just seems like the right thing to do. When was the last time after church you just went up to somebody that you may not know real well and you said, hey, let's go eat lunch together today? It may be an awkward lunch because you may get three sentences into it and realize you don't have anything in common. But you're together. Purposefully and intentionally together. And it's amazing how relationships start to build. Tuesday nights at Celebrate Recovery, I'll just tell you, I feel out of place. I get to lead worship, which is awesome. And then I step off the stage and I'm an observer. And Roosevelt's doing an amazing job. 
I love watching him in his element. But I'm so out of my element, it's not even funny. I don't know what to do other than sit there and twiddle my fingers. <laughs> but you know what? That doesn't mean I'm going to build a fence between me and what's going on and say, I'm just going to step back over here and I'll just peek over the fence every now and then and see what's happening. No. I may fall flat on my face, but I'm going to find ways to get involved. I'm going to find ways to engage. Do you look for ways? Do you look for opportunities? Do you look for those precious moments that you get to get to know somebody? Those are the things that, that, I, that I hope we start to look for. You learn to enjoy that company. Once you get in the backyard, enjoy the backyard that you're in. Enjoy each other. Don't be judgmental. But we need to understand a couple of things. Have I mentioned that I really love technology? We have to have some healthy expectations. What do I mean by that? An unhealthy expectation that will all know everybody. That's not even realistic. Now, we may all know names, but is it, is it even remotely realistic to think that we're all going to be best friends by the end of the day? No. There may be those things that, that, that we just don't connect with because we're not alike. That's okay. That's not even realistic to think that we're going to be best friends with everybody. Jesus wasn't even best friends with everybody. Think about that. What did he do as a man when he walked the earth? He surrounded himself with 12 guys. Oh, sure, he taught a lot. We read all about the big crowds that gathered. But how many of them was he really close to? Twelve. And if you read a little deeper, he was really close to about three of them. He had his little inner circle. Those were the ones that were his confidants. Those were the ones that weren't afraid to get in his backyard. He wasn't afraid to get in their backyard. I kind of wonder what Peter's fence looked like sometimes. He's a loud mouth. wonder what the tax collector's fence looked like. Hmm. Nothing to hide there. <laughs> but those were some of Jesus' closest friends. It's unrealistic to think that we're going to be best friends with everybody. It's unrealistic to think that you're going to know everybody's birthday. It's unrealistic to think that you're going to, you're going to, you're going to think about everything that could possibly be going on in somebody's life every day. It's just not going to happen. But if we start to place those expectations on ourselves, guess what happens when we fail the first time? Not only is the fence not coming down, the fence gets bigger. So we have to be realistic. We have to have healthy expectations. It's going to take some time to get the conversation to where it's more than three sentences. But give it time. Give it a shot. Have to have healthy expectations. But we also have to realize that uh, baby steps are okay. Note to self, before you use a remote, make sure it has good batteries because it has a light on it that flashes at you and tells you the battery's dead. Realize that baby steps are okay. You know, let's think about it. Living without fences doesn't mean that you're you're, you're going to get every single person into the more personal parts of your life. It's not going to happen. But you're going to have those one or two or three or four that you know you can count on. And they know they can count on you. First, we'll, we'll be hanging out in the front yard with people. Now, I, thinking back to childhood again, it, Boy, I wish that my kids could have a childhood as carefree. <laughs> I wish that my kids could go out into some neighborhood house in somebody's front yard and play basketball all day and not have to worry about them. It's just not the reality anymore. But everywhere you went, you would see people out playing. And if you didn't see them out front playing, that's because they were in the backyard where it was a whole lot of fun. Baby steps are getting to the front yard. Baby steps are just walking onto the property and getting to know each other. Baby steps are okay. Have you ever seen a baby that went straight from being held in mama's arms to running? No. They crawl a little bit. They get mad because they can't roll over. And then they learn to roll over, but they can't catch themselves, so they smack their nose on the ground. And then, and then once they 
get their arms strong enough to realize I can catch myself. Then they, they start this little wobble thing. I really want to go, but I ain't quite figured it out yet. Or they get their arms going and their legs won't go. Or they get their legs going and the arms won't go, and then there they go smacking their nose again. And then they surprise themselves when they take that first little wobble, whatever it looks like. And then you can see it all over their face. What did I just do and how do I do it again? And then before you know it, you can't keep up with them because they're going so fast on their knees. And then they're climbing up on furniture. And then they get brave and they let go and they, they stand there for a little bit, not realizing that they're standing on their own. And then they get nervous when they realize, uh-oh, I'm doing it. Kind of like Peter did when he realized he was walking on the water. And then they smack their nose again. <laughs> and then before you know it, they're walking. And then before you know it, you can't find them because they're into everything. The walking and the running and the growing up can't happen if they don't take those baby steps. The true relationships can't happen without those baby steps. Baby steps are okay. You don't jump into a relationship. I didn't meet my wife on one day and marry her the next. It was a process of getting to know each other. It was baby steps. Those are okay. We have to understand one more thing. Take some ownership in it. Take some ownership and purposefully getting to know everyone or getting to know people. Realize it's everyone's job. It's not a, well, I'm just going to sit back and wait for somebody to come say hi to me. Guess what's most likely going to happen? You're going to walk out the back door and never say hi to anybody. How many of you are, are introverts by nature? How many of you know what an introvert is? <laughs> an introvert is somebody that likes to stay to themselves. They're, they're very, they may not be a private person, but they're kind of a bashful person. How many of you are extroverts? You can say hi to anybody, and it doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter what's going on in life. You're going to put a smile on your face, and you're going to stick your hand out, and you're going to shake their hand, and, and you're going to see what happens. How many of you are like that? There's some pros and cons to both of them. <laughs> I, I, I want to, it cracks me up. You meet somebody at the store, hey, how you doing today? What's the expected response? I'm good, how are you? I want you to try something. The I'm okay, you know that's a fence, right? It's a saying, well, I'll let you hear my voice and I'll acknowledge you because you said something to me, but you're not getting past the fence. I'm not going to tell you what's really going on. I'm not going to tell you how I'm really doing. What would happen if one day somebody asked you how you're doing and you said, you know what, I'm doing pretty good. Let me tell you why. I go to church on Sundays and I have this relationship with this guy named Jesus. You probably just lost him. Or what would happen if you asked them how they're doing and they said, my day's terrible. Well, that's not the response I was expecting. I was expecting you to say, okay, but do you know what my next response is? Oh, wow, tell me about it. How many times would we go, uh, oh, um, the, milk, the milk's getting bad. I need to go check out. <laughs> Do you know those opportunities exist every single day to tear down those fences? But do we take ownership of it and do we do anything with it? You may fall flat on your face <laughs> when you say, oh, tell me about it and they unload on you, and you have no idea what to do. You know what? That's okay. I wonder the difference you made just because you were willing to listen. I wonder the connection you made just because you were willing to listen. I wonder the connection you made because when they asked you how you were doing, you said, I'm doing pretty good. Let me tell you why. Now their milk is going to get cold, and they're going to have to get, or get hot, and they're going to have to get to the checkout. But those opportunities exist every day. Take ownership of them and do something about them. How are we ever going to create community and connectedness within our community if we don't build it among ourselves? If we're not willing to 
get in each other's backyard, if we're not willing to know each other, we're not willing to lift each other up and support each other, and, and we're not willing to be available when somebody calls and said, I need help, how are we ever going to expect the fence to come down between the church and the community around us? It's not going to happen. It's a process. First, this fence has to be mended. It's finished. That fence was torn down that day at Calvary. We just have to accept it. Then these fences have to go away. These fences have to be broken down. These fences have to be eliminated, not just opened. Don't just open the gate, because it's awful easy to close a gate. Tear the whole thing down and throw it away. Burn it, never to be built again. Pastor, that makes me very vulnerable. You're right, it does. Makes you very open. Makes you very honest with each other. You know what happens when we live honestly with each other? We start to live amazingly upright lives. We start to treat people different. Because I don't have to remember the lies I told you to cover up what I don't want you to know. We start to listen to each other different. Because we know we can trust each other. I'm going to propose something to you. I told you last week we, we're going to take an opportunity next week to fellowship together and to, to eat a meal together and then to come together Sunday evening and, and just enjoy some music together. And it's an opportunity to invite people into our community. It's an opportunity to pull some fences down. It's an opportunity to make ourselves vulnerable and put ourselves out there and say, hey, I'm inviting you to come to my backyard. I'm inviting you to come hang out with me on a Sunday. That opportunity is there for you. Take advantage of it. But I want to do something else. I've asked a, a few folks this morning if they would be willing to help me with this. And for the next six months, we're going to try it, see what happens. You may have saw a slide up there that said uh, Friendship Sunday and scratched your head and said, what in the world is Friendship Sunday? The slide looked a whole lot like that. Matter of fact, it looked exactly like that. We're going to identify one Sunday night for the next six months, and we're going to call it Friendship Sunday. And here's what we're going to do. We're not going to have a Bible study. We're not going to have any kind of a discipleship class. We're not going to have any kind of special music on that night. We're not going to even come to this property on this night. But you're going to get an invitation to go to somebody's house. And all we're going to do is we're going to eat together, and we're going to play together, and we're going to fellowship together. That's tearing down fences. That's eliminating barriers between you and I. But, Pastor, that's not going to work because the same people are going to wind up going to the same people's house. I've already thought of that, too. <laughs> and let me tell you what's going to happen. I said you're going to get an invitation, right? The people that are going to host you, they're not the ones inviting you. You're going to get the invitation from them, but I'm giving them the invitations. And it's going to be a real complicated process to figure out how it works. You ready for this? I'm going to divide everybody that's at church up into three numbers. You're either a number one, a number two, or a number three. And you're going to go to either house number one, house number two, or house number three. I guess you could say the pastor is going to cast lots. That's the only thing you're going to remember today is the pastor's gambling. we're going to start tearing down some barriers. We're going to start getting rid of some fences, and we're going to get to know each other. We're only going to do it for six months. Hey, at the end of six months, if we like it and it's working, we'll keep doing it. But if in the fifth month you realize this is the stupidest thing he's ever come up with, you only got a month to go. <laughs> February 21st will be the first one. You'll get an invitation maybe even as early as next Sunday to go to somebody's house on February 21st. And all you have to do is eat, fellowship, and enjoy each other. Think you can do that? Boy, that was quiet. It's six months, whether if you like it or not. We'll see what happens. That graphic, kind of interesting to me. There's one arrow that points up, but there's two arrows that point both directions. This is a very one-way opportunity. There is no other way than through His Son, Jesus. There are a multitude 
of opportunities to make this connection. But it has to start with this one. We're going to try it. We're going to see what happens. Invite your neighbor tomorrow or next Sunday. Invite someone you know that likes good food and good music. Let's start tearing down fences. That's what connection is about. That's what community is about. And I'm going to tell you, how can you possibly get someone to believe that you love your church if you're not connected with those in your church? It's not going to happen. Why would someone even remotely want to be a part of that if they don't see that? I was, I was telling someone the other night that one of the things I love to see that just thrills me to death every Sunday is, you know, you can tell the, the general friendliness, if you will, of, of the members of a church by how quick the parking lot clears on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> Think about that. If the doors, if the aim, last amen is said at, at, at 11.45 and the parking lot's empty by 11.50, there's probably hymn books all over the place because of the vacuum that was created by people leaving. <laughs> and the pastor's left standing up here going, what in the world just happened? Nobody liked each other. It thrills my heart that that's not the case. There's, day, there's Sundays that we're standing outside in groups talking, and no matter how cold it is, saying silly things like, we really should take this conversation to a restaurant. 20 minutes later, we really should go to the restaurant. 20 minutes later, I am freezing. Let's go get in our vehicles and go. Then we go sit in line for, t- for an hour because we waited for 40 minutes to go to the restaurant. You want to you wanna judge the friendliness of a church? Seriously, watch how fast the parking lot empties. I love it. It's evident that you love each other. It's evident that you care about each other. It's evident that you want to be with each other. That speaks volumes to someone that's here as a guest. Don't lose that, but let's build on it. Fair enough? That's what church looks like. That's what community looks like. That's what connectedness looks like. And if we're going to love our church... We've got to learn to be community. We've got to learn to be connected with our community. So, as we leave this morning, just love your church. Love the people in your church. Know that Jesus loved you enough to tear down that fence of sin if you let him. That allows this relationship to work. And then go live it. Go own it. Go and enjoy one another. Life sure is a whole lot more fun when you're sharing it with people than when you're doing it all alone. Stand with me this morning. I want to challenge you this week. Well, we mean challenge me this week. You've already told me to come eat next Sunday, and I got to go to somebody's house. I don't even know. What more are you going to challenge me with? Allow someone into your yard. Allow someone to get through your fences. Allow someone to tear down the fences that you've created and allow somebody to take a step into your backyard and then enjoy it. Enjoy one another. Amen? Amen. Bow with me. Father God, we thank you for the love that you show us. Father, it's just my desire that we show that to others. It's my desire that we be a direct reflection of who you are into our communities and into the families that are around us and into the families that are in this room right here. Father, I, I, I love it when I hear someone come to our church and visit and say they just they feel the warmth here. It's not us. It's only because we allow it to come from you. Father, I pray that you'd help us to keep that priority in line. Keep that priority, number one, that the relationship with you would stay as strong as as it possibly can, and that we would not allow any fences to build between it. But then help us to begin to tear down the fences between each other and the fences between our, our church and our community. And Father, let this be a place that no one knows of judgment, but everyone knows of love. That no one knows of, 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 of fear and, and ridicule, but everybody knows that this is a place that they can come and they're going to be accepted. And they're going to see you because your word is the one that's preached. And Father, we just thank you for that. I pray that you bless the efforts as we go forward, as we, as we purposely try to get to know each other. We purposely try to create opportunities that we can get to know others. Father, we just ask that you would bless that. 
And we just say thank you in advance for the good things that you're going to do. And we pray continually to ask you to put those opportunities in front of us that we can be a witness for you. It's in your son Jesus' name that I pray this morning. And everybody said...